Welcome back, everybody. I think um, everybody who's attending this afternoon was here this morning, so we can um, go straight into the class. Welcome back, Venerable Yunten. Thank you so much for being here. So for this session, we're going to be looking more at analytical meditation. Last session, we did clarity of mind and using the mind as the focal object, which, you know, has some movement and some, you know, takes a little bit to nail it down if you ever can. But the idea is coming back to a singular focus again and again. With Analytical meditation is going to be a lot more about working yourself through an intentional structure. And the structure is something that you don't want to totally make up on your own. Um, the structure for an analytical meditation, the easiest way is to look in the outlines of the Lam Rim Chenmo. If you're wanting a good solid, you know, um, traditional, not missing anything out, good outline for your meditation. Uh, but there's also a shortcut way. So the shortcut way for doing a good analytical meditation that's not just guessing is to take a topic that you intellectually understand and have done some study, had some classes on, something that you understand the word well enough that you could explain it and it would be accurate according to the teachings. So it might not be precise in terms of terminology or fancy or anything, but you get the gist of it. So take, for example, impermanence. So impermanence is uh, the meditation that we'll do next. And if you were to just build it on your own, what you would do is start with identify what is it. Yeah, so the first step in an analytical meditation, if it's not based on an outline from a suitable source, your first step is identify it, define it. So in the case of impermanence, we're going to sit with what is impermanence from a Buddhist perspective? It means that things change. Which things change? All compounded phenomena are impermanent. Okay, so, so your first step is identify it, identify the creature. So this means you sit with intellectual understanding first so that it's clear and tidy. So you might be able to look at something like the four seals and remember all compounded phenomena are impermanent, or you might just think change, <laughs> right? Change happens. And you sit with the intellectual understanding change happens biologically, physiologically, mentally. Do I believe it? Yeah, do I believe that things change? And of course, intellectually, you do, right? No problem. So you can start that analysis without a lot of resistance, right? Because it makes sense logically. And then you sit with, okay, now that I've got it nailed down intellectually, how do I experience the fact of that? Yeah, do I experience the fact that things change in my lived experience every day? Do I assume stability or assume permanence that actually isn't there. So despite knowing better, do I actually live against my own logic? Yeah, and so you move from intellect to experience. Still kind of staying with this step of just identify what is it that we're looking at here. And so you get it clearer and clearer. And once it's very clear to you indeed, things change, yes, and you knew it before you started, right? But now you're knowing it from a deeper place, things change. Now you start the next step, which is to look at the disadvantages of when you forget that and the advantages of when you remember it. So this is a shortcut analytical meditation structure. Yeah, identify, then look at the disadvantages, the advantages, and then you come to a conclusion and then off you go. So when you're looking at the disadvantages, you want to start with some things that you've learned in class, like if I don't remember impermanence, I cling to the good things and I'm so disappointed and grief stricken once change shows itself. If I forget that things change when things are terrible, I hang on and I'm afraid and I have so much anxiety and so much aggression because it feels like this is how it will be forever. Yeah, so the disadvantage of forgetting impermanence is added stress, is grief, 
And you know that viscerally and you know that intellectually. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so you're really keeping your mind organized to look at what are the disadvantages of when I don't remember this? What are the disadvantages of when I've forgotten this? And you just keep coming back and see what your mind does with those simple statements. And the way it's a meditation and not just a reflection is that you keep yourself there and you say, I'm not going to drift off into miscellaneous tangents, even if they're Dharma tangents. I can do that later when I'm reflecting. I can do that later when I'm having a cup of tea, but not now. And then when it feels like you've really nailed experientially, it is really contributed to the stress of my life to forget this. Then you shift to the advantages of when you remember it. So again, intellectually and experientially, both. So you can start intellectually, maybe with things that you've seen in other people or things that you've seen in communities of how much more flexible, how much more accessible, how much more fun things are when you're remembering the fact of change. Yeah, and then you kind of get more personal and you think, how have I been when I've entered into an event or a relationship or a job with a background assumption, this is not forever and kind of how more spontaneous and playful and light things can be for you, yeah. And there's a reason that you start with the heavy news before the good news, right? Because you want to end with the good news and you want to end with things that will keep you inspired and uplifted once you leave your cushion. So once you look at these advantages, then you come to the conclusion, which is basically what you started with, which is, it's important to remember impermanence, <laughs> yeah? Or it's important to remember compassion. And it's so basic and you were already convinced, but now you're coming to it from a place of more depth, more resonance, and it's more likely to carry with you off the cushion. So that's a really basic analytical meditation structure if you're not using one of the traditional outlines. Do you have any questions or thoughts about that before we just jump in and do it? Okay, so as always, we will start with motivation and end with dedication. That's true of all meditations. And preliminary to that, it's nice to focus on the breath, even if just for like two minutes, because focusing on the breath helps the surface distractions settle a bit. So <clears throat> posture and breath will be our first step, which is like a preliminary. So just be in your posture really experientially. How does it feel to be sitting? How does it feel to have a body? If you notice that you're carrying any tension in the body, just very gently release whatever tension you might find. As if you're bringing a warm gaze to those areas of tension. And then shift your focus to the breath. And different thoughts will come and go and you keep making the choice not to suppress them, not to follow them, just simply choosing not to give them your interest. Back to the breath.
And as the thoughts start to settle, come back to your positive motivation. Thinking to ourselves, the purpose of our life is to free all sentient beings from suffering, including ourselves. To bring all sentient beings happiness, including ourselves. And all of that is achieved through becoming enlightened. So may the work we do now lead to the fulfillment of our potential. and consciously shift to an analytical mind that asks, what is impermanence? What is this concept in Buddhism? Explain it to yourself. Moment by moment by moment, the physical world is changing. Our mental experiences are changing. And that is neither good news nor bad news in and of itself, necessarily. It's just what's happening. Why is understanding that important on the spiritual path? Answer that question to yourself in your own words. Why should we remember impermanence? And the short answer is that in understanding impermanence, we are able to let go, both letting go of what is difficult and letting go of what is pleasurable because both of them will change. They might get better, they might get worse, but there is always movement in the inner and outer circumstances of our life. Remembering that on purpose, it is much easier to let go, to live in a flow state with flexibility, less resistance, and so become more specific and ask yourself, what are the disadvantages so far in what you've seen when people forget about change? So start in general, start intellectually and just ask what is the problem with forgetting about the fact of change? What negative impact comes from that in general?
have there been policies made in various governments that were flawed policies because the fact of change was forgotten or ignored? Have there been choices within your workplaces that have been problematic because of forgetting change? Just think of some examples that are specific, but not too personal just yet. and gradually get more specific and personal into your own life and use your memories and think about times that you might have made your own life harder and more stressful, where there was more grief because you forgot that things change. Situations, relationships, your own opinions, all of it in flux. When has forgetting that hurt you? For you as an individual is grasping at permanence or assuming stability more likely to trigger attachment and clinging? Or is it more likely to trigger aversion and fear or anxiety? What seems to happen for you personally when you forget? And so just take that knowing and try not to lose the lesson of it and shift to asking yourself, what are the advantages of remembering impermanence? First in general. Good group decisions that get made by remembering this. Useful strategies. Examples you've seen.
and shift to thinking personally and specifically in your life when the fact of change has been right on the forefront of your mind during an event, during any kind of situation or relationship, or even in viewing your own body or your own mental health, how has it helped to remember that things change? When has it helped? Sift through your memories. Has it ever been the case that remembering impermanence has actually made you more present, more engaged by remembering this moment will pass? Have you ever thought this is the only time this moment will be happening? Therefore, I need to pay attention. I need to make the most of it. There might be moments where the potential for grief, like the grief of separation, was very strong. But you made that grief less because you already assumed change was happening. You were ready for it. So there was no shock adding to the separation grief. less regret about wasted moments, wasted time. And so see if you can land on the conclusion that remembering impermanence is vital to the spiritual path and is also just helpful with daily stress relief. See what conclusion you land on in your own words about the importance of remembering this truth.
And then dedicate all of the energy you put into these thoughts to developing into your fullest potential, enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And you can relax your attention. right after an analytical meditation to kind of like stay in your seat, but shift to more reflection and say, are there follow-up thoughts that I really need to remember as I move from meditative mode to kind of daily life mode? Because sometimes you can forget all of your insights as soon as you stand up. It's like you leave them at the cushion and you can only access them on the cushion. So while you're still on the cushion, but now out of meditation, you can think things like, actually, my approach to this whole pandemic might be better if I remember impermanence. <laughs> actually, the way I engage with this relationship later today is going to go better if I remember this mood that they're in or this mood that I am in is not the way we always are. You know, and you're like immediately bringing it into your daily life. You know, and just kind of like let it roll around in your head without that... Um, intensity of focus of meditation, but still in it a little bit. Yeah. And do you have any insights that are fresh or any um, questions that are fresh are also a good thing to sit with? Like, is there a little piece of impermanence I hadn't quite touched before? Let's write it down. Or is there um, a question I've had that I didn't realize that was my issue or my obstacle? And you write that down. So anyway, if, if you have any of those questions or insights, you can share them now, but it's also a really good idea to do that after an analytical meditation. Um, do you guys have any thoughts you wanted to share? Sure. Yeah, in the compa? Impermanence. Yeah, regarding um, impermanence. Yeah. I guess my, I have two questions. One is, is love also impermanent? I'm talking about true love. Is true love impermanent? One yeah. question. Yep. Yeah. What's the other one? And if all things are impermanent, what about nirvana? Is nirvana permanent if or nirvana impermanent? Forever, eternal, that seems against the doctrine. Yeah, they're good questions. They're good questions. So it's it's really excellent if you're having those kind of questions right after an analytical meditation, like write them down, bring them to your geshe. It's really important. Um, to answer your question, is love impermanent? Um, for us, love changes moment to moment. And so we might say, I have loved someone for 20 years, but actually your love comes and goes. Yeah, so sometimes you're angry, sometimes you love them, sometimes you forget they exist. Yes, <laughs> and it rotates around. And it might be that your general opinion is goodwill. Your general opinion is, I want them in my life. I value their presence in this world. I want them with me, whatever. You have an underlying like opinion about them. But the way you actually feel changes constantly. Yeah. So for an ordinary person who's not realized, love is definitely impermanent. Yeah, definitely changes. Um, if we want, you know, permanent love, we need to be a Buddha. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes there's a misunderstanding about a couple other philosophical ideas in Buddhism. One is, um, are there any things that are permanent? There are. There are lots of things that are permanent. We talk about impermanence more because those are the problematic things. <laughs> yeah. Like there are things like uncompounded space is permanent, <laughs> right? The emptiness of inherent existence is permanent. You know, lots of things are permanent, but they're not the things causing trouble. So we don't talk about them so much. Um, nirvana, which um, from our perspective, we call liberation, is not complete Buddhahood. And so it might be an unchanging state without suffering, but there's still work to do for it to become full omniscience. So there might be an upgrade to Nirvana, um, but that state without suffering, once you've achieved it, it's not going to suddenly give you suffering. You won't suddenly suffer again once you've achieved it. So if that makes sense, yeah, like that, yeah. Um, Janine? Yeah, one of the things that was coming up for me was um, 
kind of the solidity of expectations or the way that things should be as being kind of an aspect of permanence. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. Yeah, yeah it's a good one. And like, what is fair in terms of expectations of people maybe as well? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that there's, there's a delicate dance we have to do, which is what are appropriate negotiations to make with people and agreements to make with people and promises and commitments to make with people while at the same time realizing we're not the same people who made those commitments after two seconds. You know, so, you know, I have ordination vows for my whole life. Lots of people have marriage vows for their whole life. We make these promises for our whole life as if we know who we're going to be tomorrow, you know, and there's like an absurdity in that, isn't there? But we can make an educated guess about how we're trending, <laughs> right? We can make an educated guess about, you know, so far it's been useful to be in this situation. I think I shall continue. <laughs> and promises have power don't they? Promises have power rather than an incidental, let's just see how it goes, remembering impermanence even too much in a way. Let's just see how it goes day to day. It's like too loose. It loses some power. It gets, it gets diffuse. Yeah. But then thinking, um, I will always believe today, you know, what I, what I believe today, I will always believe is also setting ourselves up for some disaster because our opinions are changing and they should, they should evolve and grow and deepen. So I think that it's this, this really razor's edge of acknowledging change can still have a continuity of agreement. You know, so what this looks like day to day might change, but there can be an underlying agreement that the best relationships have mutual respect and genuine affection. And we promise to maintain that and we will try to do it in this form, you know, or whatever. Yeah. And like in the workplace, you know, we're going to have this system of communication and conflict resolution. And if that gets out of date, we're open to, you know, new ways of doing it. We'll start with a majority model and then we'll go to a consensus model and then, you know, we'll move around and just, you know, so you're like, you're making a commitment because that is a container for power to build and momentum to be gathered and keep going. But you're also having enough spaciousness to know we don't have control over every piece of anything, even ourselves especially ourselves We don't have control over all the factors. So it's like you land on a promise, but you're landing lightly enough to shift if it just doesn't make sense anymore. So it's really difficult because there are some promises that our opinion about them is gonna change over time, but we still need to keep the promise. And there are a few cases where the promise itself might need to be broken, but that also then weakens the power of our promises. You know, this delicate dance. So, so given that, what would you add or ask? Yeah, um, that that's all very relevant, and um, I guess I guess the other aspect of that is kind of these uh, these things that we kind of take as given. Like this is this is this is a situation that this is the proper way of responding, you know, and and then and then and then kind of you know applying that with judgment you know, to, to myself and to others, you know, like, and, and that for me can be one of the more difficult things to. Yeah. Cause there's up. change and then there's evolution too. Right. Yeah. Like I, I think that part of our grasping at permanence problem is that we also think that everyone's trajectory and like series of experiences are going to lead them to the same conclusions that we have. <laughs> You know, like we're all magically going to come to the same conclusions given enough years and just general life experience. And then you meet someone, maybe your exact same age and similar socioeconomic status, racial background, et cetera, et cetera. And they have a totally different opinion. And you wonder how, <laughs> right? And why? And stop it, you know? <laughs> and right? Because you're just like perplexed. How could you come to a different conclusion? And this is another symptom of this grasping at permanence that we're sort of grasping at our opinions as self-evident. You know, we forget context. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of grief is based in grasping at permanence because there's like a shock of this wasn't supposed to happen, but it was always going to happen. We were always going to be separated from each other. Yeah, either by conflict or by death, we're always going to be separated from each other. But then when we are, we're just grief stricken because there's this shock that was like, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And we've known better intellectually our whole adult life, but we don't remember on purpose. And we don't remember on purpose that we're dying ourselves and that our own life is impermanent. And if we did, we would live so differently. You know, if we knew this was our last week, our priorities would become so much clearer and we'd become so much more efficient, wouldn't we? Like just, you know, some nonsense in our life, we would just not give it energy because who's got time for that? And some priorities that we've been putting off, we would say, now is the time, death is coming. And, you know, we wouldn't get to our deathbed and think, I really wish I had held a lot more grudges and not let anyone off the hook ever. And, um, you know, I wish I'd really told more people off and made them feel bad about themselves. And, you know, like those are not our regrets on our deathbed. Yeah, I wish I'd read more novels. You know, I really should read Harry Potter an 18th time. Like, you know, those are not the regrets. <laughs> right? Yeah, Teresa. I think I have a similar question. I, many people, when they talk about impermanence, they talk about this sense of relief. Well, I've never had that till today. Today, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, <laughs> probably because of my life circumstances the last year, like nothing matters. <laughs> right, don't go nihilist, <laughs> but yeah. So it felt a bit like, wait a minute, that feels a bit too far, but it feels like a good realization. Yeah but maybe a bit too far, nothing yeah. matters. I mean, not really, because I heard you say, if we knew things were impermanent, maybe we'd pay more attention, but I just feel like there's somewhere in the middle there that I'm yeah. missing. Did you, did you guys hear Teresa okay over the mic? Yeah, she, she was saying this letting go feeling or this relaxation, this relief yeah. that comes with impermanence is not always accessible. Um, and, you know, it's like, it is this line of you don't want to go so far as to say nothing matters. It's almost like you're saying everything matters, but not that much, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like everything matters. Just, you know, like see it in the correct perspective. You know, this is how emptiness is pointed to by impermanence. So impermanence is not emptiness of inherent existence, but it points us in that direction, just like equanimity points us in that direction. It's not the, this deep philosophical concept that all things lack inherent existence, yeah. but it gets us there. Yeah. And so it's like, we draw a frame around our experience and say, this is the significant portion, forgetting that there's this whole picture and we're the one that just drew a little frame and then gave this bit significance. And then it seems to have self-existent significance, right. you know, and remembering impermanence, then at least your little frame can see that there's things moving through it and it's not a stagnant picture, uh -huh. but then remembering emptiness, you lose the frame. Uh, yeah. And it's like, there's an everythingness in seeing the emptiness. There's an everythingness or a potentiality. Yeah. It's a space of like infinite possibility, womb-like. Yeah. Rather than nothing, it's everything in a way just everything latent, ready to, you know. So, so when you're remembering impermanence, you know, going back to impermanence, because it's a lot more tangible for us to understand. It's in alignment with the science that we were taught as children. It's, it's a lot more intellectually easier to get your head around. When you're thinking of impermanence and it allowing you to let go, it does smack up right against all of the ways in which we try to create stability and the way we assume stability is possible and that stability equals safety. And that's a whole set of assumptions that is only true contextually. Uh -huh. You know, stability could equal safety. Stability could equal stagnation. You know, stability is never as true as it seems. You could, you know, have your retirement option perfectly organized. You could have your mortgage paid off and then the economy could crash and all sorts of stuff happens, right? Um, so it could feel like the illusion of stability has been achieved. Uh -huh. And there's a practical aspect to, well, get organized, but assume it will fail. Maybe that's <laughs> you know? the relief I'm feeling. I think that's the relief I'm feeling. Yeah. yeah. It's never going to go just as we planned. Because yeah. we don't have control over all the pieces. 
which is not to say don't impose some control on your life, please do, but managing expectations is very much fueled by remembering impermanence. And sometimes with these intellectually easy concepts, we run over the top of them. You know, we miss the profundity because we get it and we got it years ago and we might have gotten it before we even met Buddhism. Uh, it's like, yeah, things change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so we miss the profundity a little bit and how much in denial of it we are day to day. You know, um, imagine how different it is like when a child hurts themselves and they don't know how bad it is and they're looking back at their parents and like, was that bad that I scraped my knee? And if the parents are like, oh, darling, oh no, then the kid cries, right? Or um, the, they look back and their parents go, oh, ouch, okay, we'll get that cleaned up and then off we go. And they're kind of brisk about it. The kid's like, okay, not a big deal. Okay, not a big deal. <laughs> you know, and they're, they're like, not sure if it's a big deal or not. You know, because they don't have a sense of the way things change or how long this feeling will last, you know? And so we forget sometimes too, when we're in the heat of this is painful, sometimes we forget our life wisdom, which is I have never felt this way forever, even though I've felt this way before, you know, that even something terrible like grief has waves and shades and movement within it. And so the worst feeling on earth does not remain just like that. You might return to it often. It might be a common habit of mind. There's all sorts of stuff to unpack there, but you will not feel that terrible for very long if you let it roll through, especially. Just like anger, you know, can you stay boiling mad for that long? You have to really work at it to stay <laughs> boiling mad. You know, you can get mad, maybe easily if that's your habit, but like to stay shaking with rage and like beat red in the face. I'm always beat red, red in the face, but you know, like really red in the face the whole time. You have to really remind yourself of all the things that annoy you on purpose again and again to stay shaking with rage. If you stop adding fuel to the fire, the mind settles down and back to equilibrium. If you remind yourself of what annoyed you, you can spark it back up again if you want. But you know, it's like none of these states of mind stay. They roll through. And the ones that are problematic, we can allow to roll through more quickly by depriving them of food. They can die a natural death. Yeah. So you just, you know, you stand on your seat with your, you know, old insights, your new insights, your newly revisited old insights, and just like keeping it. And then you, you know, take a few deep breaths, maybe write something down and then get up off your cushion. And I would really recommend, remember one thing from your meditation after you stand. Yeah, even if it's just you go to the sink, you're washing your hands, getting a glass of water, whatever. Just remember one thing from your meditation, whether it was an experience or whether it was a knowing, words or no words, it doesn't matter. But I really recommend consciously carrying the wisdom off the cushion. Does it make sense? Because it's, it's so easy to leave things here. Yeah, or you only remember when you're in your meditation space or you're in the gompa or when you're with other Buddhists or, you know, it's like you have to bring it consciously into the ordinary moments because it makes it so much easier to remember and just kind of arise spontaneously because it's so familiar. I think you're a bit cheeky stepping in since I'm supposed to be hosting, but it's just bringing up a very live question for me. Um, it, it's about, um, I know sometimes Buddhism from those that have not studied Buddhism can be characterized as a bit kind of anti-life mm. um, and yes there's impermanence um, and yet if we were able to be truly present then there's something really beautiful in just being alive right mm -hmm. yeah you're um, talking about like an apathy that can happen um, well, to be honest, I mean, it's, it's it, in my personal experience right now, it's, it's deeper than that because I've just lost someone who was extremely dear to me. And, and um, I also have some family members who have, you know, deteriorating um, chronic illness. And so it's like I have not learned, you know, I've had moments where I've been kind of meditating, you know, kind of connecting with a deity or whatever and experiencing this kind of expansiveness and whatever. But I can't bridge the gap between that experience of expansiveness 
And the sadness I feel when I'm with a loved one that I know, I know it's just the cards are stacked. It's not the time's running out, etc. And then all of this attachment and like feeling that life sucks comes in really hard. And it's like bridging the gap between those two extremes. I'm just lost in that territory. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a teeny bit. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like a, a question of relative and ultimate or, um, you know, immediate and long term or it's this like friction that we get into where we crystallize one of the truths and then that neglects the other side of it you know because that's just what we're used to doing like if you think of yourself you forget of others when you think of others you forget yourself theoretically you're remembering all all the time but we just naturally crystallize you know because we're just used to doing that so I think there's that that one piece but I think there's the other piece of I don't know if this example helps, but this example helps me because I, I, before I was really hardcore into Buddhism, I was into like a lot of group work, you know, like a good child of a therapist. I went to a lot of group activities and, you know, and like AA and NA and like, you know, um, recovery groups and these kind of things. Like if you go to a group and everyone is talking about their angst and their suffering and their mistakes, you're very happy at the end of that. And it's like, that was all terrible, sad, poignant news. And I just added mine. Why do I feel better? <laughs> you know, but if I was just sitting in my room with my angst to going, here's my stuff, <sighs> you know, I would be in a total depression, like spiral of doom. Yeah. But as soon as you're talking about with other people, there's that lift of connecting to the human experience of we are not alone in this. Yeah. yeah. And so, so I feel like the spaciousness that we experience in meditation can be tied into the relative, which is this thing that I am feeling is part of the universal human experience that I am now connected to. And this very pain is the thing making me not alone. You know, and before this moment, I was so alone with this pain. And as soon as your mind gets expansive, you have connective abilities. It's like, I always feel like psychology builds connection and Buddhism reveals connection and both are necessary, you know, both tools are necessary, but you know, in your meditation, you're experiencing the fact of the connection already. And then you come back to your, to yourself afterwards and you're like, and I'm still really sad, <laughs> you know, or really angry or just heavy, tired or whatever it is. And if somehow, in your expansiveness, then you can bring your life to it. That can help. Yeah, once you're in that place, then you're adding the life to it. I, I think that can really, it can really enrich something. And, and then when you do something like Tong Len, giving and taking practice, it, it really works better because you don't feel kind of like as oppressed by human suffering you feel lifted like you're the filtration system that's wow. it like okay here's mine i take it here's yours i take it let's take all of it and just roll it through and roll it through yeah and yeah. it kind of makes you feel brave yeah even grounded thank you i'll um chew, chew over that response thank you yeah 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 i mean there's a lot of directions to go but i'm glad you brought it up because it's it's a thing yeah thing yeah so i think something about when we dedicate and when we motivate also is touching that piece of all of this energy me one little person put in may it go to this greater good may it go to this expansive goal may it go to the actualization of my potential which is enormous but that potential is something everyone has and even by acknowledging that I'm lifted out of the sadness of seeing human suffering. And, and I always feel like this is a key point in Buddhism that makes Buddhism really useful in society is that compassion is not empathy. We can become exhausted by empathy. We can get empathic distress, empathic overload. And empathy is a very useful tool, but some, you know, they're, depending on how you define empathy, it can also be a tool of manipulation. I feel how you feel, and that means I know how to manipulate your emotions to get what I want, and it can get, like, you know, creepy and terrible. So it's, a, you know, in a way, it's a neutral skill. In compassion, we're being with and seeing the suffering, 
and we're being with and seeing the potential simultaneously. And what's more, we're identifying with the potentiality more than the suffering because we know the suffering ends and the potentiality doesn't until it's actualized to Buddhahood. So if we're thinking of what people are, what they are closer is their potential. The suffering and the neurosis are temporary and moving all the time. To identify people as that is a limited view of them and of us. But that's where we get tired if that's all we ever see. And why wouldn't we get tired? We'd just be like, why watch the news? Why read anything? Why talk to anyone? It's like too much. But if you can see it through the gaze of understanding potential, it doesn't bog you down and you don't get that empathic distress. How do you bridge how do you make that bridge of seeing the potential? Because I'm, I'm among family members that are not spiritually oriented right now and they are facing the, the kind of, you know, debilitating, debilitating illness. And so their conclusion has been, and I don't blame them, to mm-hmm. it's seize the moment, go out for another beautiful meal, enjoy this moment together because we know the clock is ticking. And it's how, how do you get somebody to actually see a different potentiality? Or maybe you can't, maybe that's proselytizing. Right? Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's so poignant, God. And I think that, you know, you answered your own question, you can't make anyone believe anything. But I think that you can offer an invitation that they can choose to pick up or not. And I suppose way- I'm actually, I haven't got that conviction enough in my own being, or I might be able to radiate it somehow. Because yeah. I, I get stuck in the impermanence. And, and I, you know, I've been around amazing llamas, but I still it's like that's them not me kind of <laughs> yeah, it's normal. yeah it's normal and I mean how do you get conviction in your own potential you mm. try some stuff enough times to see that it works yes. flawed and imperfect as it is yes. and that makes you think maybe if I keep trying it'll keep working <laughs> you know and then the years go by and you're convinced even though you're not good at it yet even though you're not yeah. perfect at it yet I think even if we're like just hanging around Buddhism for a few years and not even doing tons of meditation, we see that we start to catch ourselves more often, just naturally, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're kind of saying the proof of the pudding is in the eating and it's like uh, applied Buddhism equals meditation. So that's what we're talking about today, I guess. (laughs) Right, but it means that if I'm sitting next to someone who does not have faith that they can change, I have faith that they can change. I don't need to tell them that, but yeah. my being is communicating that. Yeah. Because I know that none of us are fundamentally different from each other. We all have a clear and knowing consciousness. We all have innate ignorance and we all have Buddha nature. You know, Good and time. those three things are the same for all of us. It's just the details are different. <laughs> you know? yeah. and, Thank uh, you so much. There's a lot there. Thank you. So, you know, meditation just really means to repeat repeat, repeat. Um, If you're never, if you're feeling unsure about how to approach a particular meditation, don't. Yeah. Just go back a step to reflection. Yeah. Reflect on it. Like what would the structure be? What is the essence of this concept? And if you're stuck there, go back a step to hearing and think, obviously I need to go to more classes on this or read more books on this or study more on this. So never fall into the trap of thinking the only way to wisdom is meditation. Yeah, there's the wisdom of hearing and the wisdom of reflection and the wisdom of meditation. And they're all mutually reinforcing. And if you're not ready for one, go back to the next or to the prior, right? Just, and then of course, once you've been meditating on something a while, you have enough space for clear questions to then go back to class with and ask about. Like how many years does it take to even have a good question? Have you ever been in these classes with these llamas and they say, are there any questions? And you're like, I have a million questions, but I cannot put any of them into words. Uh, I'm I'm missing this opportunity with this amazing being and I can't articulate, but yes, I have questions. (laughs) Cannot use words, (laughs) explain the things, you know, right? It takes a lot of sitting to even like have a good question. That's not just a ramble of context before getting to the point. So, you know, be pleased to have a doubt or be pleased to have a moment of here's where I'm stuck because that is the gateway to wisdom. It's not an obstacle. It's actually a really good sign. Yeah. Um, My own teacher recommends keep a tiny notebook and pencil by your meditation cushion because every once in a while when your mind is settled down enough, 
you have a bit of a breakthrough that you don't want to lose. And so while you don't want to indulge a tangent, you also don't want to lose an insight. So you sort of push pause on your meditation, write down, this means this, I had not figured that out before, big star, put it down, go back to your meditation. Yeah, and that's really good training of, I will touch that, I will address that and straight back in. Yeah, it really helps the discipline because otherwise this like important thing you remembered or came to is niggling at you the rest of the meditation and you either give in and go with it and then feel bad that you didn't do the meditation properly or you ignore it and then are cursing that you can't remember what it was. <laughs> yeah, so instead of either of those, you just touch it, name it, contain it in some way and come back. And if it's something not important, it's a similar thing. You just don't have to write it down. You know, you think must get milk. Anyway, I will come back to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pick up children from school. That is important. Set reminder. <laughs> is, it, is it making sense? Do you have any, any hanging questions about meditation before we call it a day? Just can yeah, Teresa. say something quickly. There's something that you said, of course, in a different retreat. You said our Buddha nature, we have done that far longer than this personality. So, so much better to identify with that. And as I'm listening to Kath, I'm just thinking about the impermanence of that, that this personality, this family, this circumstance, this mental health, this whatever is passing. Yeah. But our Buddha nature is always there. So I think of those realizations that I've had, that's when I'm in my truest self. Yeah, yeah, and your, your Buddha nature is, is really the most practical place to identify, even though you're growing into it, and it's not like a finished product. It's not that you're a Buddha, and you just need to wake up to it. It's not that simplistic, but you do always have that potentiality, like raw gold that can never be destroyed, and that makes way more sense to put that's me rather than your personality and your suffering and all of that. You know, all your personality and learning and stuff, you can think of as here's some tools that have landed here, you know, and like I will pick up and use the ones that are still relevant and I shall let expire the ones that aren't, you know, so I'm glad this all wound up here, but you're not so cling to it like that makes me good or that makes me bad. It's just like wound up here. Identity, place that on Buddha nature, even though it's not the subtlest view, it is way closer. Okay, well, we'll, we'll dedicate. And um, thanks very much, you guys. I appreciate it. Um, we'll just take a minute and dedicate that all this energy go to our full enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. <laughs> everyone. Thanks, Catherine. Can I just wrap up with a couple of quick sure. announcements? Yes. Just to say thank you very much. Um, we're, we're so fortunate. Um, just authentically very um, grateful. Um, and just to let everybody know there are some more opportunities coming up to um, study with Federable Yonten. Um, it's again going to be this hybrid format of um, up to 10 people who register in a timely fashion can can come and be in the gompa because of the covid restraints um, and then any number of people can join online um, via zoom um, it's the teachings on the um, six perfections um, which is the um, part of the lam rim and um, training to become a bodhisattva um, and that's Wednesday nights from now through until um, early December, and it's 7 p.m. Pacific time through to 8.30 p.m. Pacific time. Keep an eye out 
on our website or look at our newsletter for more information. And the calendar is the top left-hand corner of the homepage of our website where it says Dharma programs. That's how you can find everything that's lying ahead. And um, we've got lots of great offerings there. So please take a look. Catherine, and, um, and if anyone just rocks up without registering, there's some room on the porch that we can pop you on. So, you know, if you're random, you can sit on the porch and the speaker is turned so you can hear. So <laughs> please register, but if you forget, porch spots available. Brilliant. All right, thanks guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.